Now, we're going to get into a real special argument. Now, this argument has taken almost 18 and a half years to develop, so I want you to pay attention. Excuse me a second here. This argument is a unique concept that has been honed like a razor to a very meticulous edge so that you can understand what's going on. Obviously, we have established clearly that you have a constitutional right. And obviously, we have established that you are the beneficiary of the contract. And we have established that the Constitution is a contract in writing enforceable in the court of law. And we have established that you have a right to claim specific performance on the contract. And we have established that it's supposed to be interpreted in your favor. So if you've got an honest constitutional belief, they have to listen. Now let's take that to the next step. The next step is, can a state arbitrarily and erroneously convert your right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it? Now, uh, I don't know if, can you see this pretty clearly? This, uh, right here? All right, let's start, start with here. We're going to start walking down this sheet, okay? Murdoch versus Pennsylvania, U.S. Supreme Court. Now, when you want to go into the law library and you want to look up something, what you want to do is understand that Supreme Court is Trump, okay? That's the clearest way I can explain it to you. If you got a Supreme Court case, that trumps a, a, a district court, that trumps a, a court of appeals, that trumps a state court, that trumps everything. So you want to deal with Supreme Court cases as best you can. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania is a unique case. It's recorded at 319 U.S. 105. That's the 319th volume of United States Supreme Court reports on page 105. So when you go to the law library, go into U.S. reports, Ask the little gal there, the little guy that's behind the counter, where is the United States Supreme Court report? So they'll tell you right where it is. You grab volume 319, you turn to page 105, and it'll give you the case of Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania is a real unique case. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to read the case. You get the case. The judge always likes to see that you're ready. And I'm going to summate basically the case briefly. Basically, it is a religious test case wherein Jehovah's Witnesses, in the, in the year of 1943, wanted their right to be able to go and preach among the public, because that is their right to evangelize, okay? Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, they wanted them to have a license to solicit, okay? This is basically the crux of the case. Now, what happened was, uh, this, the Jehovah's Witness claimed their First Amendment right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the right to worship and, and uh, exercise their religion, unencumbered, right? And, of course, that's one of the mainstays that, that founded this country, was the religious freedom, okay? And basically the points on the case that are established are a state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution, and that a flat license tax here involved restrains in advance the constitutional liberties of press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress their existence. All right, let's pull that over there. Everybody see that? Okay. All right, I'll start again. A state may not impose a charge for the re enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution. And that a flat license tax here involved restrains in advance the constitutional liberties of the press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress the exercise thereof. That the ordinance is non-discriminatory and that it applies also to peddlers of wares and merchandise is immaterial. The liberties granted by the First Amendment are and in a preferred position. Since the privilege in question is guaranteed by the federal constitution and exists independently of the state's authority, the inquiry as to whether the state has given something for which it cannot ask a return is irrelevant. All right? No state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Now, a lot of people come back to me and say, well, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, so that case doesn't apply to me. I want you to reach. I want you to understand we're not talking about whether you're a Jehovah's Witness here. What we're talking about here is are you an American and do you have rights? What they are talking about here is that these Jehovah's Witness people exercised their rights timely. That they had a right to worship and exercise and, and, and worship their God and evangelize as they chose. And that the state came in and arbitrarily converted that right into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it. That is totally unconstitutional. Now we took that case as a pioneering case and we argued that case for all of your constitutional rights. 
All you need to do is keep in mind that you are an American and you have constitutional rights, number one. Number two, you have to keep in mind what right. Can you pull the right out of the Constitution? If you can pull the right out of the Constitution, and I'll give you an example. How about the right to travel freely and encumbered, pursuant to Shreve versus Thompson, and we'll get into that. How about the right to keep and bear arms, right? Does a state have a right to require a license and a fee for the exercise of the right? And if they do, can you ignore the license and the fee? We'll get into that. Now, obviously, in this case, it's clearly established, and this is the premise of this case, no state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege issue a license and a fee for it, and require you to have that. Otherwise, you committed a crime. That's totally, 100% unconstitutional. I want that to get across real clear. Now let's jump to the next case. By the way, Murdoch is recorded at 319. That's the 319 volume. U.S. Reports, page 105. We'll start the case. All right? Go read the case, though. Make sure you read the case. I don't want anybody to come up and tell me they didn't read the case, because I'm going I'm to get on you. You're not following. That's failure to follow instructions. Okay? Now, we're going to walk down the next step of this case. We, we took care of Murdoch here. Let's go to Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, which is recorded at volume 373. The same U.S. reports, you go to volume 373, turn to page 262. When we go to Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, this is another unique religious case, okay? In this case, six ministers were accused, excuse me, of inciting to riot and otherwise create a disturbance and disturb the peace, Okay? They had a sit-down. This case came down in 1962. And what happened was they said they needed to have a license to, to have a public uh, gathering. Okay? And what happened was it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, no, 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 you don't need to have a license for the exercise of a First Amendment right to freely assemble. Okay? Right, basically, the, the gist of the case is... Uh, the Negro ministers were convicted in Alabama State Court of aiding and abetting in violation of criminal trespass ordinance in Birmingham, Alabama. The only evidence against them was to the effect that they had incited 10 Negro students to engage in a sit-down demonstration at a white lunch counter. Actually, there were six ministers, but only two got charged. As a protest against the racial segregation. And they cite other cases. A lot of times you can find other cases in these cases. In Gover versus City of Birmingham, Alabama, this court today holds on the authority of Peterson versus City of Greenville that the convictions of those 10 students for criminal trespass were constitutionally invalid. Since those convictions have been set aside, it follows that these petitioners did not incite or aid and abet any crime, and that therefore the convictions of these petitioners must be set aside. Now basically what they were claiming is their constitutional right to freely assemble. The cities was claiming that they had to have a license to put on a demonstration, which they didn't have, and they were charging them with a criminal trespass for not having a valid license to freely assemble and or uh, protest, okay? Now, the gist of this case, I want you to see the significance of this case in view of the second of the, the case we gave you before that. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania clearly established that no state could convert a secured liberty and a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Because everybody got that. Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama said that if the state does convert your right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. they got to let you go. All right? Does everybody see that? It's very important that you understand, first, your Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and that you have that right, and that that right shall not be infringed, and it's supposed to be enforced in favor of you, the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. It's very important that you understand that no state may convert that right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. And if they do, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama says you can ignore the license and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. Now, the next case is very important, and it's very important that you see the argument. Okay, that's United States versus Bishop. That's 412, I am 412, United States Reports. This is page 346. We come down here. United States versus Bishop is a very unique case. Basically what Bishop does is it sets a standard for what constitutes a criminal violation in terms of willful intent. Okay, 
Willfulness is, is one of the major elements that is required to be proven. In any criminal element, you have to prove, one, that you're the party, two, that you had a method or an opportunity to do the thing, and third, that you did so with a willful intent. Now, when we get to willful intent, willful is defined as an evil motive or intent to avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty. Obviously, in the previous two cases, you have decided that you have relied on the United States Constitution. And you have relied on decisions of the United States Supreme Court. So, could you have willfully done any deed or crime? Obviously not. So, guess what? This case stipulates that you have a perfect defense to the element of willfulness. All right. Since the burden on the prosecution is to prove that you did willfully and knowingly avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty, he cannot perform that task, can he? Because it's obviously you have a constitutional immunity to that. The previous case, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, says they couldn't even punish you. The case before that said you didn't need a license for the exercise of a right. And the case before that said your constitutional right is supreme over any state law. So if they pass the law in violation of your constitution, the constitution overwhelms the state law. So the law doesn't even exist in law. Does everybody see that? Now, since the prosecutor does not have a cause of action for which relief can be granted, Your Honor, may it please the court, counsel is specifically precluded from performing his major task. Therefore, Your Honor, may it please the court, at this time I would motion most graciously for a dismissal with prejudice for failure to state a cause of action for which relief may be granted by this honorable court, and I'd kind of like to collect my costs and fees for having to defend this patently frivolous and spurious complaint, sir. May it please the court. Laughter will usually break out thereafter, at which point the judge will usually turn to the prosecutor and say, Well, Mr. Gross, what do you think we ought to do about this young fella? And he'll say, I'd go for the motion to dismiss, Your Honor, and the judge will turn to him and say, That's a good answer, because I don't think you're ready for this kid today. And 40 attorneys will break out laughing. Okay, that's actually happened to me, folks. I'm telling you, this argument is a killer argument. It's good for every single constitutional right you've got. All you have to do is fill in the blanks. What constitutional right? Prove that you have the constitutional right. Tell them the state doesn't have a right to convert that right into a privilege. Tell them that they can't even punish you if they do. And then claim that the prosecutor can't prove willfulness, so you obviously didn't do no crime. And then flip around and demand for your dismissal, which is your right, and get your costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous case. May it please the court. And I promise you, you will be amazed. Forty attorneys will jump up and say, yeah, they'll come up and shake your hand and tell you that's one of the most magnificent arguments they've ever heard. They'll tell you you got something like King Kong for taking on the Bar Association or whatever. Now, I'm telling you these things that personally happen to me, I can relate the exact cases. That goes for practicing law without a license. Obviously, you got a right to work. you got a right to contract your, your, your right to work as you see fit, not as some arbitrary and capricious Bar Association sees fit, right? Doesn't that make sense to you? You don't want to belong to the union, that's your right. This is a this is a right to work state, right? The bottom line is this. They cannot compel you to have a license or pay a fee for the exercise of your right. And if they do, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. And since you got a perfect defense to the element of willfulness, they cannot punish you. They have to dismiss. They do not have a cause of action. Now this argument I'm telling you is taken plus over 18 years to develop in courts and in law libraries over the years and just kind of compiling and arguing cases and doing this. This argument is a killer argument. There have yet, have they ever won against us on this argument? Uh, nor could they in the United States of America as long as the Constitution stands. I'm asking that you pay attention to this argument and start utilizing it. We'll show you some of the techniques later in the second half, all right? Now, the word willfully has the same meaning, all right? In controlling the voluntary, intentional violation of a known legal duty. And the distinction between the statute is found in the additional misconduct that is essential to the violation of the felony provision. If they can't prove willfulness, they can't prove nada. Okay? Because everybody got that. Now, let's go to the next one. Now that you've won and your rights have been violated... The next thing they will claim, well, we acted in good faith, or well, we acted in good faith, we had good faith reliance that you broke the law. Okay? And that means you can't sue us. That's a lie. You see, since these two cases, Owen versus City of Independence, which is recorded at 100 volume, and you want to look at Supreme Court reports, now that's a different reporter. 
Supreme Court reports will actually say on the back of the reporter, Supreme Court reports. It won't say U.S., it'll say Supreme Court reports. So, so that's a different volume. It's a newer, a newer reporter. So you want the 100th volume, and you want to look up Supreme Court reports, and you want to turn to page 1398. There is a... A, also a uh, counterpart case to this Owen case, which is Memp which is uh, Maine versus Thibodeau. I'll give you a site for those. Okay, I gave you Owen versus Saving Penance, so I'll give you Maine versus Thibodeau. Maine versus Thibodeau is recorded at 100 Supreme Court. That's 100th volume. Supreme Court reports, page 2502. Now, basically, the summation of what these what, the, what these basic arguments say. Where plain language of a statute supported by consist, consistent judicial interpretation is strong, it is not necessary to look beyond the words of the statute, right? Now, what these are both civil rights cases. The right of action created by statute relating to deprivation under color of law, of state law, of a right secured by the Constitution and the laws of the United States encompasses claims which are based solely on statutory violations of federal law and apply to the claim that claimants had been deprived of their rights in some capacity to which they were entitled. Now, whenever this happens, folks, you must understand something. And that goes for both Maine versus Thibodeau and Owen versus City of Independence. And I'll tell you the brief synopsis on both these cases. Owen was a police chief in a town of Independence, Missouri. And he got in a gripe with the city council and they indiscriminately fired him without just cause. Owen turned around and sued. They claimed that they acted in good faith. The Supreme Court said, Sir, you are deemed to be officers of the law. You are to advise us to the law. You can hardly claim that you acted in good faith for a willful deprivation of the law. And you certainly can't claim ignorance of the law because a citizen out here in the street can't claim ignorance of the law. And it makes the law look stupid if an officer of the court or some officer of government doesn't know the law. And then they go ahead and abuse somebody's constitutional rights. So in matters of constitutional rights, both these cases uphold one point. And the point they uphold is that whenever they violate your constitutional rights, they do so at their own peril. And it even says that in Title 18. United States Code Section 241 and 242. It says that upon conviction you are subject to a $10,000 fine, 10 years in jail, or both, and if death results, life in prison. They're telling you don't violate somebody's rights. Please, don't do that. Title 42, United States Code Sections 1983, 1985, and 1986 clearly establish your right to sue anybody that does that. Now, they're going to claim you can't sue them. Because they have judicial immunity. Well, guess what? These two cases remove judicial immunity. There is no judicial immunity for violating somebody's constitutional rights. Judge, you are deemed to know the law and sworn to uphold it. You can hardly claim that you act in good faith for willful deprivation of the law, and you certainly can't plead ignorance of the law. For that, it would make the law look stupid for a knowledgeable judge to claim ignorance of the law when a citizen on the street can't claim ignorance of the law. Therefore, there is no judicial immunity. I want to get that across. I don't know how many attorneys come up to me all the time and tell me, well, they're immune. Because they acted in good faith. They're just not reading their court. They're not reading their court reports. Because if they were reading their court reports, they would have known this case has been on the books since 1982. Both, both these cases came down in 1982. So I want you to pay attention to these cases. When somebody tells you they can violate your rights with, with impunity, you just kind of smile and say, make my day. Okay? Now... The next case we want to talk about is Briars versus United States. We, we mentioned it previously earlier. Briars is recorded at 273, volume 273, U.S. Reports, page 28. Okay? Now, Briars versus United States is a, neat, a unique case. It's a search and seizure case, but basically it sets constitutional standards, which we had talked about in the am jurisprudence sections. In the am jurisprudence sections, okay? I especially want to pay attention to note number three here. Constitutional provisions for the security of a person and property are to be liberally construed, and it is the duty of the courts to be watchful for the constitutional rights of the citizen and against any stealthy encroachment therein. All right? When a federal officer participates officially with a state official in a search, so that in substance and effect, it is their joint operation. The legality of the search and the use and evidence of the things seized is to be tested in federal prosecutions, as it would be if the undertaking were exclusively the federal agent. All right? The reality here is what they are setting 
is the standards must be liberally construed in favor of the citizen. It's the duty of the court to make sure that happens. So now you have a right to be wrong. You have a right to uh, enter your viable defenses that you honestly think. No state can convert that right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee. If they do, you can ignore the license and the fee. They, have, must per, they must prove the burden of proof of willfulness, which they cannot do. If they do violate your rights, you do have a right to sue them in Owens versus City of Independence and Maine versus Thibodeau. They have to give every consideration to you, all right? And that's the way it is. 1900 yesterday, all right? The next case we want to talk about is Boyd. Boyd versus United States is recorded at. It's recorded at. Uh, 116, volume 116, United States Reports, page 616. Has everybody got that? Can you see? Bear with us, folks. We're really trying to jam here for you. Boyd versus United States, 116 U.S., page 616. The court is to protect against encroachment of constitutionality or secured liberty. All right? Now, it is equivalent to a compulsory production of papers to make the non-production of them a confession of the allegations, which is is pretended they will prove. And a lot of times that happens in federal cases. They'll claim something, they won't prove it. It's happened to me, believe me. And then the fact that they've claimed it makes it true. Alright? Now this <coughs> excuse me. And then of course you have to prove a negative, which is impossible. All right. Now, the seizure or compulsory production of a man's private papers to be used in evidence against him is equivalent to compelling him to be a witness against himself in violation of the Fifth Amendment and in a prosecution for a crime, penalty, or forfeiture is equally within the prohibition of the Fifth Amendment. See that? Now, the bottom line here is Boyd protects against encroachment of constitutionally secured liberties. It's arguing the Fifth Amendment here, but it's basically arguing against encroachment, all right? So that's one you want to pay attention to when you're coming, especially to things on search and seizure natures. Another good case that you should know is your Miranda versus Arizona. And folks, I'm going to tell you something, and even I can learn something. Not that I'm that much above you. I want to come to you hum humbly in humility. I'm, I'm telling you, I've read and I know, and there's a lot of things about the law, and I've been my own attorney for over 25 years, and I kick the tail out of them, I'll be honest with you. But I always can learn something, and I'm not stupid enough ever not to realize that. And the next thing I'm going to tell you is probably one of the most important things we're going to tell you today. This is the Miranda versus Arizona decision. It's recorded at 384, volume 384, U.S., that's U.S. Reports, page 436. Now, this is a heavy-duty case. Every American should know this case backward and forward, upside down and other. All right? Miranda versus Arizona. This is the one that says you got a right to remain silent, you got a right to an attorney, you got a right to have your attorney present during question. Anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. If you can't afford an attorney, want to be appointed for you by the court. Do you wish to make any statement on your behalf and you understand the rights that I have spoken to you? As soon as they stop you, talk to you, as soon as they start talking to you, they are required to say that. If they don't say that, they screwed up. If they haul you into jail and they don't tell you this, read it to you. And then they want to make you sign a little uh, statement that you know your rights and you knowingly waived them. Please, folks, don't sign that statement. Use your head for something other than a hat rack. Do not sign that statement, ever. You are knowingly waiving your constitutional rights. Don't ever do that. I mean, they don't make, they don't make it that hard. As soon as you hear those people start talking that, you tell them right effectively, I want to talk to an attorney. And I'm not saying nothing until I talk to an attorney, especially if you're talking to federal people, BATF. These people will lie, cheat, steal. They will do anything they can to hammer you. Their whole purpose in life is to hammer you. I don't want you to think, oh, what nice guys. So maybe we can just work this out. Why don't we just talk and maybe we can get things worked out. You don't talk to these people, folks. And you're talking to somebody you learned the hard way. You do not talk to these people ever. I don't care if you think you're a nice guy and you want to be courteous. I don't think you think if you're going to work it out. I don't think you think if you're going to, you're smarter than they are and you can beat them. I'm telling you, you don't talk to them. Period. You button that hatch. An old uh, wise uh, legal defense counsel told me one time. He said the first rule is keep your big mouth shut. I said, okay. What's the second rule? Keep your big mouth shut. He said, what's the third rule? Keep your big mouth shut. 
is that after you follow them three rules, the rest is easy. It's when you open your big mouth that you get in trouble. Not that you would do anything wrong anyway, but they'll twist, lie, cheat, and steal and make it into something you didn't do. And before you know it, you won't even recognize what's happened. And I'm telling you it's happened to me. So I'm telling you as a friend. I'm not telling you as a smart ass or anything else. I'm telling you as a friend. Do not talk to these people. They, they do not have your best interest at heart. And you may think, well, they're the government. And, and they, they're responsible. And they mean well. Well, they don't. They don't mean well. They don't mean you're well. And they will jam you. Believe me. And if you're not real good at getting out of it, you can, you can be in a lot of trouble. All right, now, let's look at this Miranda decision. In the absence of other effective measures, the following procedures to safeguard the Fifth Amendment privileges must be observed. The person in custody must, prior to interrogation, be clearly informed that he has a right to remain silent and that anything he says will be used against him in a court of law. He must be clearly informed that he has a right to consult with a lawyer and he, to have a lawyer with him during interrogation. Do that, please. And that if he is indigent, a lawyer will be appointed to represent him. All right? If the individual indicates prior to and during questioning that he wishes to remain silent, the interrogation must cease. If he states that he wants an attorney, the questioning must cease until an attorney is present. Where an interrogation is conducted without the presence of an attorney, and a statement is taken, a heavy burden rests on the government to demonstrate that the defendant knowingly and intelligently waived his constitutional counsel right. <sighs> Don't test that theory. But I'm telling you, it works. I did it. Where the individual answers some questions during interrogation or custody interrogation, he has not waived his privilege and may invoke his right to remain silent thereafter. The warnings require that the waiver needed are in the absence of a fully effective equivalent prerequisite to the admission or admissibility of any statement, inculpability or exculpability made by the defendant. The limitations on the interrogation process required for the protection of the individual's constitutional rights should not cause an undue interference with the proper system of law enforcement, as demonstrated by the procedures of the FBI and the safeguards afforded to other jurisdictions. In each of these cases, the statements were obtained under circumstances that did not meet constitutional standards for protection of the privilege against self-incrimination. Now... This is the big one, folks. This is the one they're talking about. Did you properly Mirandize him? Was he Mirandized? Was she Mirandized? If they don't Mirandize you, they got to throw the case out. Almost always. It's very hard to go forward with the case if their witnesses are excludable from the presentation of the case. Now, I personally got lucky on this one, folks. And I thought I was really, really good. And I am really, really good. But you want to know something? I have a different standard of equity and law. And I treat everybody kindly. And I basically give them courtesy. And I basically try and be a regular Joe. What happened? A regular Joe. And I basically uh, try to uh, basically just find out what the heck was going on with this case. I promise you I would never do that again. I would dummy up like there's no tomorrow. I wouldn't say nothing. Not that I'd do anything wrong, but here's the thing. These people lied so bad. They put so much trash in, in the record. I was in shock. I couldn't believe that anybody would deliberately do such a thing. But they will. So I'm telling you as a friend, do not talk to these people, especially BATF people. They are not honorable people. They don't hold... They do not recognize the honor you serve. They are not honorable people. Their whole purpose is to hammer you into a position of, of ridiculousness. So I'm telling you, if they come in to talk to you for whatever reason, I don't care what, you dummy up. You don't say nothing. You got me? You hire an attorney. You get an attorney there, and you don't talk till the attorney tells you to. That's what I'm telling you as a friend, okay? It's Miranda versus Arizona. Now, there's four Miranda cases. This is the leading case. There is a Miranda warning case that actually locks down the, the steps of the warning. And then there's a Miranda interrogation case, which, which, which locks out the standards for uh, in-custody jail interrogations, okay? Now, a word to the wise should be sufficient, and I shouldn't have to ever say nothing about that again. Believe me, I learned a valuable lesson. 
you cannot assume that everybody is a good guy. There are some bad ones out there, <laughs> and I found them. Now, the next case we're going to talk about is Norton versus Shelby County, recorded at 118 volume, United States Reports, page 425. Basically, that says an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties, affords no protections. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as an in inoperative as though it had never been passed. Okay? And that's what this, this case holds. All right? Now, I'm telling you, you go read the case. Don't screw around. The judge asks you questions about the case. You better know about what it says. All right? Because if he thinks you didn't read it, he's going to throw your case out. The court follows the decision of the highest court of the state in construing the Constitution and the laws of the state unless they conflict with or impair the eff efficacy of some principle of the federal Constitution or of the federal statutes or a rule of the commercial or general law. The decision of the state courts on questions relating to the existence of its subordinate tribunals and the eligibility and election or appointment of their officers and the passage of its laws are conclusive upon federal courts. All right? Now, the most important, some of the most important thing is, while acts of de facto incumbent of an office lawfully created by law and existing are often held to be binding from reasons of public policy. That's a very important point, public policy. You want to watch out for the terms public policy. It's often confused with the state's right of eminent domain of police powers. Police powers and public policy are almost the same thing, except one's done without law because we wants to, and the other is done because they're claiming a police authority to do so. All right? But when they're talking about public policy, the acts of the person assuming to fill and perform the duties of an office, which does not exist, can have no validity whatever in law. Okay? An unconstitutional act is not a law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties. It affords no protection. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as inoperative as though it had never been passed. Okay? Has everybody got that? Now, this basic first portion of this program is designed clearly to help you. And if you take these basic cases on this one page, you will have gone a long way in getting your constitutional rights back. Okay? Now, we're asking you to pay attention. Learn your Constitution. We're going to go into some heavier stuff through the second portion of that. But we want you to learn your Constitution. This book here is a citizen's rule book. It also has jury instructions in it. It also has a lot of important arguments in it. Some of the important arguments in it go along with what we've been talking about. Right? All laws which are repugnant Constitution are null and void. Marbury versus Madison, 5 yes, 137. We already argued that one. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rule or lawmaking or legislation which would abrogate or abolish them. That's again Miranda versus Arizona. An unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights and imposes no duties, affords no protection. It creates no office. All right, that's Norton versus Shelby County, which we just talked about. The general rule is an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and name of law is in reality no law, but is wholly void. All right. 16th Am Jurisprudence, 2nd Section 177, and also 256. Officers of the court have no immunity when violating constitutional right from liability. That's Owen versus City of Independence and Maine versus Thibodeau. No state shall convert secured liberties into privileges and issue licenses and fees for them. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. If the state does convert liber liberty or a privilege into a privileged citizen, can engage in a right of impunity. That's Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama. The court is to protect against any encroachment of constitutionally secured liberties. That's Boyd versus United States. Constitutional rights must be interpreted in favor of the citizen. That's Breyers versus United States. We have covered all of these cases thoroughly so that you can see clearly. All right? We're trying to teach you how to better effectively use your Constitution. Okay? We're trying to get it down to a serious program where... What do you want to do? Alright. All right. And this, this book here also brings out all of these court cases, right? Notice it's got Norton versus Shelby County in here. It's got Miranda versus Arizona. It's got Madison five Marbury versus Madison. It's got uh, the jury has a right to judge both the law as well as the fact. John Jay, first Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court. The jury has a right to determine both the law and the fact. Samuel Chase, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, 1796, singer. In it, all right, the jury has the power to bring a verdict in the teeth of both law and fact. Oliver Wendell Holmes, U.S. Supreme Court. The law itself is on trial quite as much as the cause, which is to be decided. 
Harlan F. Stone, 12th Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court. The pages of history shine on instances of the jury's exercise of its prerogative to disregard instructions of the judge. That's United States versus Doherty, 473, Fed Second, 113. All right, now, <clears throat> we're going to wrap up this first part here. Basically, we want, we want you folks to hopefully not be overwhelmed. Take your time. Play the tape several times. It'll it'll come to you. It's really not that hard. We want you to have a new reverence for your Constitution. We want you to know that a lot of brave soldiers paid for it with their life. <coughs> Excuse me. We want you to know that they died miserably, some of them. And we want you to know that this is a serious, very serious thing here. We want you to know that we love you, America. <coughs> We want you to know <coughs> we need your help. We need your help. <coughs> we need your help to learn your Constitution so you can better and effectively come forward, pick that book up, walk out there and shake that book and say, Shake it, boss! <coughs>